the, the problem is, as far as reform that's needed, and one of the key things that's needed, is insurance companies have become risk selectors <clears throat> instead of risk takers. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying by that. And, um, you know, anybody that wants it should be able to buy it. That's one of the issues. But then we have an issue, what if you don't want to buy it? That's, that's an issue that needs to be discussed because there are people that say, I don't want it, I don't need it, I'm not going to pay for it. Uh, you know, where do we draw the line? Uh, you know, on all those things. But that, to me, a good reform would be for carriers to have to take all, all comers. This you know. is a huge issue. My concern is there's so many people impacted. And I'm going to give you just my, my sister's trying to call me right now. My mother's 85 years old. Bill's met my mother before. Jim Anderson, a few people have. She's a farm lady, lives up on the farm, North Missouri. Self-sufficient, lives by herself. Got a little four-wheel drive Explorer that we bought her years ago. She goes to the store, goes to her doctor's appointment. But guess what? Her eyesight's failing because of what? Cataracts. She's 85 years old. Does she deserve to have cataract surgery and get her vision taken care of? And Medicare is going to pay for that. You guys and I are paying for that with tax dollars. Does she deserve that? Okay. We have a friend whose father had back problems, excruciating pain, 95 years old. The only way to fix it is to go in, I think they did an orthoscopic deal, and they inserted cement in there to numb it up, and he's fine now. I don't know what the cost was, but I bet it was ten, fifteen thousand dollars 15000 95-year-old man. Does he deserve that? <laughs> so all these things cost a lot of money. And the next gentleman you're going to hear from, I'm going to turn over to him, Steve Edwards of the hospital, and then Don Sorensen are both health care providers. They don't hear anybody in this room or any of us for any of our parents or loved ones say, no, we don't want that. But it costs a lot of money for them to have it available and have it available like that. Okay, if you want an MRI, you see the doctor, you can probably have one done tomorrow. There's a cost to have all these things. And so we have a huge public debate that needs to occur. There are people that need insurance. We need to establish, but a debate needs to occur. We don't need to just pass legislation in a 90-day timetable and things like that, but we need to have a debate. In our rush to fix what is broken, we should not break what is fixed. In every major city in the United States, there is a medical center that is as good or better than the best in the rest of the world. Our system fosters magnificent innovation. There are more patents for pharmaceuticals and medical devices emanating from the United States than the rest of the world combined. In many ways, our healthcare system is a reflection of the proudest elements of our culture. It is innovative, entrepreneurial, it's high quality, it's quick, and it's accessible if you have access. To a great extent, the world relies on our collective knowledge for medical development and innovation. Yet our current system is characterized by bewildering contradictions. We are the very best for approximately 260 million Americans. And tragically, we leave about 46 million Americans behind. <clears throat> Springfield is a reflection of our national health care debate. Both Cox and St. John's have been recognized among the best in the country. Both been recognized as a top 100 integrated health care system, I think, combined almost 10 times. Yet our community, our region, and our state are plagued with fragmented health care um, for those without insurance. At Cox North and South alone, we have seen our uninsured patients increase by 60% over the past several years. Our allowances for bad debt and charity have increased from 33 million approximately seven years ago, six years ago, to over 100 million this year. In the last four months, we're averaging $10 million per month. Not-for-profit hospitals struggle to be the safety net for those that fall between the cracks. Through increased insurance premiums, that high cost of indigent care is shifted on to those who can pay. Those who, who can afford care are paying for those who cannot. This becomes a hidden tax. And because those without insurance tend to access care through the emergency department and the most expensive avenues, this hidden tax is higher than it could be if they had access to primary care. At Cox Health, we could reduce our charges by 62% and still have the same bottom line if only one thing would happen, and that's everyone pay their bill. First of all, I'd say that the health care financing system we have in place today in this country is perfectly designed to give us the results we have right now. And those results 
are excellent health care in many cases. We extend life, we, we cure disease, we cure pain, we help families. Uh, the patents that we talked about, the, the drugs that are, that are available, uh, it, it, we have an excellent health care system with many flaws. And that's what we need to talk about and have the real debate and discussion about what are those flaws to fix but to preserve the things that are happening excellently every single day here in Springfield at Cox and St. John's every single day where miracles are being made to happen as well as across the country. I will tell you that the flaws that we see or the challenges we see in the delivery of health care is the fragmentation and the uncoordination of care between doctors, specialists in primary care, and between the doctor and the hospital and other institutions. That fragmentation is part of the challenge nationally to the cost equation and the quality equ equation. Um, I think some of the things that we're looking out for that will have potential impacts on especially the small business um, are the pay-to-play options that are out there or the increased penalties and fines for those that are maybe not able to provide health insurance coverage. I think everybody in this room would love to probably be able to provide that coverage if possible, especially if you're a small employer, maybe you have a small shop, you would love to be able to give that option uh, to your employees. But you know, sometimes it's just not in your bottom line. You know, especially in today's economy, you're struggling to try, to try to keep your doors open. Is it possible for you to provide that coverage that you may want to? Sometimes it's not. And should you be penalized for not being able to do that? We don't think that's right. We think there should be other options that are on the table to maybe provide you with opportunities to provide that coverage. Something that's being discussed, thankfully, in the Senate Finance Committee and something that I know here locally, uh, Rita Needham's group with SAMA has done a great job is, is trying to pool some resources together. Uh, bring opportunities for small businesses to pool those resources together. Maybe barter for the best deal in terms of providing coverage. I think they have roughly 3,000 lives that are covered in this area. It's the fourth year for the program in Springfield. Uh, have one of the best bargaining units in the area in terms of trying to keep those health care costs down. Um, I don't know about you know most of you in the room, but have you found your health care costs going down in the last few years? Mm -hmm. No, you haven't. Um, sorry to jump in. I should have let you answer that. But I would imagine most of you have not said, uh, yes, they've gone down. No, they really haven't. So there's options that have been discussed that can be considered to potentially, you know, do some good health care reform instead of putting penalties in place for small, even medium-sized uh, employers that are going to tell you, you have to do X before you can do Y. We don't feel that's right. We don't feel that's a good free market enterprise. We have the same concerns about bringing in the government option and the impact that that's going to have um, on the business community. Um, sounds good in theory, but the impact of that is going to potentially cause a cost shifting that is going to incre potentially increase that cost for the employers that are trying to provide the health care right now. At the end of the day, they're going to have to make a decision. Can I provide it? Can I not? Okay, maybe I'm going to get penalized. I don't know. Maybe I'm not. All of a sudden, they're just going to step away and say, guys, I, I can't provide the coverage that I want to because of this public option that was supposed to provide you know, all the answers for us. Then we're right back to where we were at the beginning. You know, a small employer trying to make a decision of what do we do to keep the doors open and to take the best care of our employees. Hey. There were some great ideas that were discussed here today. Uh, I think I want to touch on a couple more that we're looking at. Uh, we talked about the pooling of resources. Um, health information technology is a great one that's been discussed. Um, we talk about it and we talk about it, and there's some that are t making the effort to do it, but there could be, there's a lot more opportunities out there to try to consolidate records, increase the access, um, consumer education. Um, is a great thing. Know what your health records are. Wellness prevention. Um, some great things that can help lower those costs uh, down the road. Definitely would be very helpful. And one that was touched on, and I wish it was be touched on more, is medical malpractice reform. Tort reform, whatever you want to call it at the end of the day. There is a reason that billions and billions of dollars are spent each year in the health care system, and they don't go back to the patients. Where do they go to? Um, and I, not to offend any attorneys in the room, but they tend to go to those folks that are working on those cases, driving the cost up, scaring doctors and providers to death in the process, and maybe sometimes stepping away from what is the right kind of procedure because they're worried about getting sued at the end of the day. That's not the way the health system should work. So we need to make sure when you're out there talking to folks, encourage them to bring that discussion to the table. Have, have that should be part of the reform. Why not get every option that's out there on the table? Don't just talk about a handful and leave a few obvious ones over here uh, to not be discussed because maybe we don't want to mess with that faction of, uh, of our constituency. Let's put them all on the table.